Have you ever dreamed of representing your country in sport? I'm Fern Lullum, I'm here from Aniridia Network and I'm delighted today to be talking to the wonderful Amanda Dennis. She was born much like myself with Aniridia, but very unlike myself, she is a goalball player and Paralympian. That's amazing, Amanda. So can you just start off by telling us a little bit about your level of vision? Yeah, so... Um, I have congenital aniridia, so I was born with it. Um, I actually have quite stable vision, but when I was younger, I had a little bit more than I have now. I can only tell you in the American Schneller system, um, when I was younger, it was 20 over 200. So whatever a normal person can see from 200 feet away, I could only see from uh, 20. Um, and for me, that's about 10% uh, at the time. And I have uh, a little bit less now, somewhere around 7%, but it hasn't really um, had a noticeable difference for me in my visual um, field or anything like that. I've just kind of kept going forward. And it's always been um, kind of one of those things where you learn how to adapt with the things that you're given. So um, I've never really noticed that big of a difference um, from A to B. It got a little bit worse, but it wasn't such a big noticeable difference that I was like, wow, I've lost so much vision. It was kind of a gradual change because for me, for a while, I kind of um, disputed the fact that I could not see as well as a lot of other people. And I have obviously glasses and um, I have prosthetic lenses as well now that I'm older, but I never really wanted to wear the glasses because I was like, ah, no, I can see just as well with the glasses and without the glasses. And so I had a couple of years where I wouldn't wear the glasses and that actually made my vision a little bit worse. I can definitely identify with that. I've certainly been through phases of my life where I've sort of shunned everything to do with visual impairment <laughs> and been very yeah, stubborn. Exactly. <laughs> I think most of us go through it at some stage or another. Do you have any of the associated conditions uh, to aniridia, like glaucoma or anything like that? Like that so I have nystagmus um, so my eyes do move a little bit to be able to focus I have astigmatism but I don't have glaucoma yet <laughs> um, <laughs> I know sometimes it will come later if I have any sort of eye surgeries um, I do have cataracts as well so they do need to be removed but I actually um, am looking at an eye surgery that's being offered in the US where they will take the cataracts out and replace your lens, but at the same time, add like an artificial iris that will help with some light issues so that light sensitivity won't be that big of a deal. But in the US previously, it wasn't FDA approved. So it was $10,000 an eye. Oh. And I was not willing to pay that. And um, so I'm still waiting a little bit because the surgery has been approved by the FDA but the, the colored part of the lens that will help with some light sensitivity hasn't been approved. So I'm still waiting to figure out um, when I want that to be done, but I've been told by every single eye doctor I've seen in the last few years that I do need to have my cataracts removed. So I'm just waiting for that moment. Yeah, waiting out as long as you possibly can. <laughs> I don't blame you. It's such a big dilemma, isn't it, when it comes to surgery? Yeah, it's kind of one of those scary things because um, I, I know actually quite a few people who have aniridia and they have mixed reviews about having the surgery. They'll say, yeah, you know, getting your cataracts removed, it helps so much. And then I have some people who say that their vision actually got worse. And um, my mom has aniridia and she had the surgery that I want to get, but she had it a little bit later in her life. And so she went from having maybe um, 8% vision to maybe now having four after the surgery. And that's scary thinking, wow, I could have this surgery and, and lose even more vision than I already have. So yeah, it's a very big decision, isn't it? You never quite know what to do. And it's hard, like you say, you get very mixed reviews from other people, which doesn't make it any easier. Do you have any other visual aids, Amanda? I know you mentioned glasses, but do you have, you know, do you have a guide dog? Do you have a cane or anything else that you use? So I use a cane mainly for traveling. Um, I'm not using it on a regular basis, mainly because I think I can get around pretty well. My only uh, barrier to getting around sometimes is taking the steps. <laughs> um, as actually, I, I don't have very good depth perception whatsoever. So sometimes I won't even see that there's a step down or steps in general. And, you know, it could be a disaster. Um, so it's for me... Um, learning how to use those things more on a regular basis, like for confidence reasons. But, but 
Um, I wish I had a guide dog just because, you know, I, I love the companionship of a pet, but I, I don't feel like I need one just yet. So um, not yet, actually. Yeah, oh, maybe one day. I, I have to say I have a guide dog and I agree. It is very, it's very lovely and you get lots of cuddles, lots of companionship. It, <laughs> I have never looked back after getting mine. So maybe one day <laughs> you'll have a little fairy friend too. My husband is actually um, also visually impaired and uh, he's looking at getting a guide dog. So, cause I begged for a dog cause I really want one. And we actually uh, live together in Berlin and uh, he's like, yeah, uh, you know, we're not going to get a regular dog. It would be great though to get a guide dog because you don't have to pay taxes on the guide dog. I so mean, I was like, okay, absolutely, you want, gotta have right? some benefits. <laughs> so, absolutely, but he'll get a guide dog. He's actually um, his vision is a lot worse than mine is, so um, he actually really needs the dog. And I, I kind of have more of the personality that until you really need the dog and you can use it all the time that there's no point in getting it because otherwise it's just a pet. So yeah, um, yeah. we're, we're going to wait until uh, he's supposed to get one next year and he actually really, really needs the dog. Aww. Um so, you know, it'll be my pet, but his service animal. <laughs> so. Fair dues. That, you know what? That sounds like me and my partner with, with my guide dog, Nancy. He's half the time, um, he's he's with her most of the time, really, to be honest. <laughs> um, more than I am, perhaps. <laughs> but yes, it is, it's a lovely thing. And I'm sure it will be a, a great addition to your little family. So for those of us who don't know too much about the sport, tell us a little bit about goalball. What does that involve? Sure. So goalball is a three on three combat sport played by blind and visually impaired athletes to play goalball on the Paralympic level. You have to have less than 10% vision. So in the American Schneller system, that's 20 over 200 because there's varying degrees in vision for the sport of goalball. Everybody is blindfolded. Um, the, the game involves uh, three on three. So there's a nine by 18 meter volleyball sized court with tactile lines all around the court. There's a 1.25 kilogram ball that has bells embedded inside and the players who are on the court are either throwing it to try to get it past their opponents who are listening to the ball and trying to dive across the floor and defend it together as a unit, as a team. So not um, one person is just defense. Um, all the players are diving together and all of the players are also offense players. So um, you're basically working together um, to block the goal behind you, the nine meter wide net. So um, it's quite a unique sport. It's actually one of the only Paralympic sports that has no Olympic counterpart, which is um, a little bit difficult in trying to get goalball better known um, in the sporting world or the athletic world, just because it doesn't have an Olympic counterpart, but it's one of the most exciting Paralympic sports. Oh, it sounds very exciting. It sounds quite tricky as well. I mean, I take my hat off uh, to you for being so good at it. And it's interesting that you mention the issue around having to have a certain level of sight, because I have heard recently of people from the UK who play goalball, who can play domestically, but they can't play internationally because their sight is rated as B4. I think that's too much sight, basically. How do you feel about that rule? So the, the thing with the B1, B2, B3 system in goalball is that it's actually not really, really important to have those different levels of sight because everybody is blindfolded. But if you look at the other side of that with the people who are over 10%, the B4s, the difficult part comes in that where do you draw the line of what is two-sided? And that's, I think, what the issue is um, in goalball right now that the, the um, legally blind is less than 10%. But if you let people in who are over that, where do you draw the line of they're visually impaired enough, but you know not too two-sided to play? Um, and so I think that's where IBSA is kind of having an issue because um, I think they're thinking when you're over that amount of vision, that you potentially could play normal sports, but at the same time, that's still a significant vision loss. So it's really hard to say. I would say in goalball, it doesn't really matter because everybody's blindfolded, but um, in some other sports, maybe track and field, swimming, uh, judo, maybe that is a significant difference to give that person a leg up. And I think maybe um, they're trying to say, with goal ball, they can't let somebody in and goal ball and say, okay, you know, you're over 10%, but that's okay. 
Um, but in swimming, if you come in and you're over 10%, that's not okay. So they're trying to make it kind of equalized all over the Paralympic sports with legally blind athletes, what is okay and what is not. And um, it is difficult because when you're in that in-between area, you might not be able to succeed at other sports because of your visual impairment, but yet you're too good to play the Paralympic sport. So um, it is a really sad uh, topic kind of for those individuals who have that. Mm, somewhere in that gray area in between. I know I've heard people say, you know, this is the sport designed for visually impaired people. And yet I'm being told I have too much sight, even though clearly I'm, you know, registered visually impaired for all intents and purposes I am. And yet, yeah, I'm being told that I can't do this. Exactly. But I think in, in other ways, you know, in other sports, if they were to go in, that they would kind of face the same issues that uh, if they wanted to go into swimming, track and field, judo, any of the sports that support visually impaired athletes in the Paralympics, that they would say, ah, oh, you're two sided, but yet you're still blind. And, you know, we still can't support that. So um, it's just unfortunate in their case. Yeah, it's a tough one, isn't it? So what first got you involved in goalball? Yeah, so my story is a little bit different than everybody else's. Um, so I actually played soccer when I was a kid, um, mainly because my older brother did. And he was, I wouldn't say he was great at it. I don't actually remember, but it was enough where I was like, oh, he got, he gets to go play this sport um, on the weekdays and on the weekends. And I want to do something like that too. I want to be just like him. And so I begged my parents to go play soccer. So I went to soccer for the first time and I thought it was all great and dandy um, after my brother went to go play. And then all of a sudden I got out there and I couldn't see a thing. I was literally just sitting in the middle of the field being like, I can't see a thing. Like, I don't know how he's doing this or how he's enjoying this. And I, after begging my parents to play soccer, I was like, I never want to come back. <laughs> I don't want to play sports again. This sucks. This, the sport isn't for me. Um, and I then begged them never to play sports again. <laughs> um, and so I, I ended up just doing different things with my life, kind of going different directions, playing different instruments, doing things that weren't athletic. And then my parents uh, basically came to me and said, hey, there's an adaptive sports camp in Atlanta. And it was left behind by the Blaze Sports Organization, which is the uh, Paralympic legacy left behind by the 1996 Atlanta games. And it's a really great organization that helps athletes basically get a gateway into sports and show them adaptive sports. And this camp was specifically for athletes who had a visual impairment. And I didn't have a lot of um, experience with other visually impaired athletes at the time or visual impaired people because I was one of the only people in our district, county, school county that had a visual impairment. And so I went to this camp and it was so great. They, they taught you how to adapt sports so that you couldn't say, I can't do this. This sport isn't for me. Um, and they actually had athletes who competed in a previous Paralympic games, whether it be Athens or Sydney, and they were teaching you their sport and showing you their medals and sharing their passions and their stories about their sports. And one of the sports that was showcased um, was goalball. And it was so amazing because it was one of the only sports where everything is equalized. Nobody has an advantage over everybody else. Everybody's blindfolded. You are either as good or as bad as, <laughs> as you are. Um, and it was just one of the coolest things that I couldn't say, well, I can't do this because like this person sees better or I can't do this because I'm just not good at it, you know? Um, <laughs> I, no I, excuses. <laughs> exactly. I could be as good as I wanted. And I was around seven at that time and um, I, I got a passion for it and my parents supported me with this endeavor and took me twice a week to Atlanta every week for practices um, to support me and wanting to be good at goalball and wanting to be a good athlete because that was finally something that I showed interest in and I never looked back and surprisingly <laughs> one of the people who actually taught me goalball is one of my uh, like USA teammates today. And she's uh, such a great role model for everybody on our team because she's such a hard worker, but also one of my first role models as an athlete going into goalball. So. Oh, how lovely. That's amazing, isn't it? What a small world. You're all still together now. Exactly. That's great. So does Anna Rydia um, present you with any particular challenges when you're playing goalball? So not particularly when I'm playing goalball because I'm not actually needing my vision for the sport. Um, 
if you were in any situations where you had to train, for example, outside of the goalball court, if you had to be outside when it's really bright, um, that can present challenges visually. But as far as inside of the sport of goalball, there's no barriers, there's no challenges to playing. And I guess for, for goalball, something that's really interesting is your whole life, at least for, for me in my life, people have always told me, use your vision, use the vision yes. that you have, like, you know, you can make it whatever you want. And then you get to goalball and they're like, you can't use your vision anymore. <laughs> you know, you don't have anything. And so really you're, you're, you're having to learn how to adapt not to use it. And it kind of creates something where, you know, you can use uh, some of the knowledge that you're gaining in goalball and other aspects of your life, how to adapt things, how to roll with the punches and um, just things like that. That's really helpful. Mm, definitely again something that's very relatable you go through life adapting to everything so why not this <laughs> and Mandy I mean you've you've got some fantastic records in goalball you've done some such amazing things what would you say is your greatest sporting achievement to date oh my gosh that's such a hard <laughs> that's question <flawed> you. <laughs> there's really great achievements like winning a world championship that was wow really great and getting a bronze medal at the Paralympics was such a cool experience um, I would say, I guess the bronze medal at the Paralympics would be the highest achievement because that's the world's largest stage. Um, and it, it is, it takes a lot to win a medal out of Paralympics. You, you can have the skill and not win a medal. Um, I've experienced that previously. You can have um, everything you need and not win it because you didn't have any luck on your side or it just wasn't your day or the, you know, the referees weren't the best, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so there's so many things that come into getting a medal at the Paralympic Games that are besides the skill that you have. And so I would say the Paralympics is the probably the highest achievement, but probably not my favorite, favorite moment in sports for goalball in general. Ah, but it must be incredibly exciting to be going to the Paralympics. And so what are you most looking forward to uh, about going to the Games? Yeah, so this time around for the Paralympics, it's it's gonna be such a different experience going and playing. Um, for me, I decided to make the move after the 2016 games to Fort Wayne, where we have our resident training center um, and train full time. And to do that as an athlete, we finally got the resources in the US to, to be able to train full time with our national team coaches and teammates. And you, know, you learn so many things while you're here um, how to deal with other people on a normal basis um, that you may not get along with all the time, how uh, you learn the value of hard work that you may not have known before. Previously, we had three training camps a year and that's it. And now we're training every single day together. And you more importantly, learn how to be a really great teammate and you, you learn how to adapt and how to move forward, even not on your best days of training. And for me going into this Paralympic games, I, I feel great because we've all put in the work um, and we finally get to show it, but it's been five years now between the last games and this one. And uh, you know, this team out of all the teams that I've been on London, Rio, but now Tokyo, this team is the best team that I've been on. We have really great team chemistry. Uh, we work really well on the court together. We're all like good friends. We all um, can kind of, mesh together and, and work towards the common goal. And all of us have put in these last five years together in Fort Wayne. And like, this is the most we've ever trained together. And so I guess for me, I'm looking forward to the entire experience because this is something that, that I've never experienced as an athlete. And it's a whole new world to be able to say, you know what, we put in five years every day together. And like, this is the most prepared we've ever been for a games. And this is the closest team that I've ever been on before. And we just have fun together. Like, I'm just looking ex forward to the entire experience of being with everybody and, and working together towards our common goal. And honestly, this time, because of the, the new resources we have, I think we have better feelings going into this time. We know how to deal with things like adversity when they come up. We know um, to look one step at a time and not look forward five steps and then get caught up in the step that we're in. Like there's so many really great things to look forward to. 
It sounds amazing. It's all boding very well for success, I think, Amanda, especially your team spirit and everything. That's such a lovely thing to listen to you talking about there. So what advice would you give? Obviously, you've learned a lot of lessons throughout your journey, not just about goalball, but about life in general and about how people working together and everything. So what advice would you give to aspiring athletes who might have aniridia? One of the things that I learned over the time that I've played sports is to never be afraid to ask questions. You know, it's kind of a scary world when you get into sports and you know, you're looking at all these really great athletes and you're like, wow, they're so good. And you, you go in and you never ask any questions and you just want to look from them and learn from them. But one really cool thing is that so many athletes are so willing to help the next generation of athletes because they want to see you stand tall and represent your country and honestly just be successful. And so the, the thing that I've learned over everything, over sports, over school, over anything I've ever been, is to ask as many questions as possible because that's the only way that you learn. Because at some point, you never, ever stop learning. And the, the second you choose to stop learning is the second that you stop succeeding. And so always be full of questions, always move forward. And, you know, when you ask questions, you'll gain experience along the way. And it sounds like you've had a lot of sort of emotional ups and downs. And, you know, um, to get to this level of achievement that you have, it must take a lot of persistence and a lot of, you know, confidence and belief in yourself and determination because it's so easy to just give up, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. And, you know, you have a lot of support along your way. So for me, my family has been a huge support. And going into Tokyo, you know, we don't have any spectators, but I'm actually pretty lucky because my husband is also a Paralympic goalball athlete and he'll be there competing for Germany. And so I will have family there um, supporting me and uh, pushing me forward where a lot of other people won't have that. And the crowd support or the support from the people who are closest around you is what really helps you succeed in the end too. And so I'm very excited that this time around that There's so many things that will push us forward because of that. Absolutely. It's been such a pleasure talking to you, Amanda. I've just been grinning from ear to ear listening to your story and it's just very, very exciting. I have to say, as the UK team haven't been able to qualify this time, I will be cheering you on all the way for a gold medal. I hope you get there. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you so much for, for chatting to me, Amanda. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks for having me.